Hello, students. This is Professor Gore, and this is uh, uh, the last recorded lecture for the 1970s. And in this um, lecture, we're going to cover environmental issues and the Jimmy Carter presidency. So, um, as I mentioned in previous lectures, the 1970s economy is not great. The 60s economy was awesome. The 50s economy had a couple hiccups, but overall, it was great as well. Um, and so, because of the OPEC crisis, um, you're going to have oil supplies that fell short. Um, with, with gas prices skyrocketing and so forth. Also, one of the things you began to see is that foreign competitors began making cheaper and better products. So there were lower costs than American-made products. All the economic indicators, uh, indicators though, uh, like inflation, um, uh, employment, productivity, and growth, all were negative in the 1970s. So OPEC is an organization of petroleum exporting countries. And that when... Um, Egypt and Syria invaded Israel on uh, the Yom Kippur Jewish holiday in 1973. Israel was saved by the United States and Netherlands sending emergency uh, military supplies. I've covered this previously, but I want to kind of recap this here. And um, Saudi Arabia, which leads OPEC, um, responds by cutting off oil exports to the U.S. and uh, Netherlands. Okay. And so what ends up happening is the United States runs into a gas shortage. And anytime you have demand high, supply low, prices go up. Okay. And so about 40% increase in prices and so forth. Uh, also, um, you began um, having an environmental movement that took place uh, as well. Now, one of the things I will mention about the environment, um, with OPEC, uh, what you end up having is uh, Japanese competitors come in with fuel efficient four cylinder engine cars. Um, this is considered one of the greatest uh, business failures in American history, but the guy who invented the fuel efficient four cylinder uh, engine that Honda and Toyota ended up adopting was actually a Stanford graduate and, and pitched his uh, engine design to Chrysler, Ford, and General Motors. But because gas prices were so cheap, they rejected it. He went to Japan, offered it to those companies, and the rest is history. Um, and so, um, oil prices peaked at about $34 a barrel, which obviously it's, it's more than that today, and $31 in 1973. Um, so the, the country did put a national speed limit of 55 miles an hour to conserve fuel. You see that again, um, what happened in World War II. Um, but Americans began buying more foreign, yet more fuel efficient cars. Um, and that's, that's a big time effect on the economy because one out of six American jobs at the time was tied to the auto industry. And so that's going to hurt the blue collar sector big time and also cause massive inflation. The gas crisis, though, gave a uh, boost to the environmental cause as people realized that resources were not limitless. Uh, many Americans want a quality of life defined by a healthy environment and by access to unspoiled nature. Now, one of the, uh, one of the individuals who had a tremendous impact on the environmental movement is Rachel Carson, who is right here. She, she frequently appears on tests. Uh, and quizzes. Um, and her book, Silent Spring, she talked about the horrible effects of DDT. DDT is actually a pesticide to, uh, that, that was sprayed on people to keep uh, bugs from biting you and so forth. It ends up being outlawed because of the, the harmful uh, environmental effects and so forth by DDT. Okay, They used to spray it out as kids were playing on the beach or playing baseball games. I'll never forget I was playing American Legion Baseball in high school one summer in Pine Bluff and, and uh, we were playing and all of a sudden this uh, uh, insecticide truck drove by spray and all that and the wind was blowing. I was out in left field and I was like, my words, this is terrible. Uh, but anyway, uh, others became concerned about uh, the oil pipeline through Alaska, a proposed airport in the Florida Everglades and a huge oil spill in January 1969 off the coast of Santa Barbara, California. Now, the first Earth Day was organized uh, and on April 22nd, 1970, I remember in elementary school, we used to plant a tree each year um, on Earth Day. And so um, there's about 20 million American citizens that gather in communities across the country to express their support for the endangered planet. Okay. You also, um, nuclear energy began growing uh, thanks to the United States developing nuclear weapons. And um, really, people saw that nuclear energy could be a saving grace for um for the uh, electricity sector and so forth. Um, but the problem is, is uh, what do you do with the radioactive waste? And what really changed the nuclear power movement was what happened at Three Mile Island. This is near Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. 
the nuclear plant came very close to a meltdown. Thankfully, it did not. Um, and so they're able to evacuate the area and so forth. Uh, but what happens is because of this scare, um, they the nuclear movement's kind of slow. Now, it seems like every, I don't know, decade or so, there began to be a push for nuclear power plants and then something happens and then not as many are built. I remember they were proposing 25 new nuclear power plants in the United States, but then there was an earthquake in the Pacific Ocean that caused a tidal wave to Japan and it, and it, it almost caused a nuclear reactor meltdown off the, uh, at a nuclear power plant in Japan. And then what ends up happening is um, uh, that, that movement kind of gets slowed as a result. Okay. Now, um, one of the things you'll see is that there became a National Environmental Policy Act of 1969. Even though Nixon um, kind of reversed some of the environmental stuff of Johnson, he is concerned environmental pre uh, president by creating the, the Environmental Protection Agency. Um, also, thanks to Ralph Nader and his book, Unsafe at Any Speed, a national network of activists fought everything from consumer fraud to dangerous toys. Uh, now, I mean, you, have, you see toys re recalled if they're a hazard to children. Um, staffed largely by student volunteers known as Nader's Raiders. That's actually what they were called. Uh, the organization pioneered such legal tactics as a class action suit, which enabled lawyers to represent an entire pool of grievance in a single litigation. Dozens of other groups emerged in the 1970s in effort to combat the tobacco industry, unethical insurance and credit practices, and a host of other consumer products. Okay. Um, now, the, um, Nixon also signed the Clean Air Act, which established standards for auto emissions that caused air pollution. Uh, Congress also banned the use of DDT, thanks to Rachel Carson, in 1972. And in 1980, created the Superfund to finance the cleanup of toxic waste sites. Um, also, you had the Endangered Species Act of 1973 that expanded the scope of Endangered Animals Act of 1964, granting species such as sna uh, snail darters and spotted owls protected status. On the consumer front, a big victory was the establishment of the Federal Consumer Product Safety Commission in 1972. At a time of rising unemployment, activists clashed head on with proponents of economic growth and global competitiveness. So you're going to have um, conflict because the economy is not great. People wanting jobs. Uh, some people who are desperate for work and have trouble putting it on the table are going to care more about a job than the environment. But those that have a job who are passionate about the environment are going to care more about that than somebody who doesn't have a job. And so that's where you're going to have the conflict. Um, now, um, the highest cost of the Vietnam War and the Great Society contribute to a growing federal deficit and a spiraling inflation. The industrial sector of the country faced growing competition from Germany and Japan, and America's share of world trade do dropped from 32% in 1955 to 18% in 1970 and was head down. As a result, in 1971, the value of the dollar fell to its low lowest level since World War II and the U.S. posted its first trade deficit in almost a century, which is crazy. The GDP dropped after uh, 1972 to 2.9%, and nine Western European countries surpassed the United States in per capita GDP by 1980. Man, the economy is not great. Uh, the economy is also characterized by stagnant, stagnating wages, unemployment, galloping inflation. This period has been called stagflation. Prices still rose in a stagnant economy. And the average American saw their standard of living decline. No bueno. Um, also, one of the things that you began seeing is deindustrialization. De they began calling the uh, the Midwest um, and some of those uh, northern cities the Rust Belt um, because what you'll see is you'll experience an expanding technology sector and a decline of the old school American industrial factory sector. For steel in particular, the iron ore supply was running out, so it had to compete for natural resources with competitive world markets. The United States always kind of had cheap availability of iron ore. Pittsburgh, uh, Pittsburgh area was particularly hit, hard hit. This began what people have called deindustrialization. Um, and so you'll see a lot of towns kind of shrink in size because of a decline of industrial jobs. It's sad because a lot of these blue collar workers had middle class um, lives. Um, and so also uh, the, they lost a lot of union jobs. They had good paying union jobs that, that, that went into decline. So it's not good for the economy. Also, um, the down economy led to more labor strikes. 2.4 million workers participated in work stoppages in 1970 alone. And challenged by foreign competition, industry became more resistant to union demands and labor, labor's bargaining power waned. Instead of higher wages, unions now mainly fought to save jobs. By the end of the 1980s, only 16% of Amer American workers were organized. 
Um, so you see that the labor movement peaked in the early 1950s. And because that second red scare and then industrial jobs losing as more and more uh, jobs are going to the technology sector, but also American companies are starting to manufacture stuff overseas, you're going to see the labor movement uh, steadily on decline. Also, you had taxpayer revolts as well, because Americans who are having a stagnant economy and, live, and uh, having a lower standard of living are not going to want to pay increasingly high taxes. Um, and so you're going to have an anti-tax uh, sentiment across the country. California in particular voted for Prop 13, which rolled back property taxes. Still, California has one of the highest tax rates in any, any uh, nation in the union or any country. I'm sorry, any state in the, in the union. Um, it also capped future increases and harnessed all tax measures, state or local, to a two-thirds voting requirement. And this inspired tax revolts across the country. This is actually a picture of Three Mile Island. Um, they filmed um, the Wolverine movie, actually, at Three Mile Island. All right, let's talk about the presidency of Jimmy Carter. I used to show a video clip to my high school students where it was like when Jimmy Carter first announced he was running for president as a former peanut farmer and governor of Georgia, all these people were like, Jimmy? Jimmy who? Who? Jimmy? And so um, let's talk about Jimmy Carter. He is a one-term president. Um, he is not going to be seen as a successful president, and that's objectively speaking by uh, numerous historians um, across the country. He is considered a Washington outsider. And you got to understand the, the, the climate that led to Jimmy being elected. Uh, Carter would never have been elected had Watergate and Vietnam War not happened because he was a very honest, hardworking man. And he ran on the campaign that he was never going to tell the country a lie. Um, and he was he was spot on about that. Um, his big initiative is human rights, human rights, human rights, human rights. Um, foreign policy wise, he's really going to have uh, one success, and that is the Camp David Accords. Um, Jimmy Carter is one of those guys who probably one of the hardest working American presidents ever had um, and certainly was honest. And he's actually had a very successful uh, career after he's left the White House. Um, but but Jimmy had trouble delegating tasks and. Um, tended to try to do everything himself. He would look over memos for hours and hours and hours and, you know, stay up till two o'clock in the morning. But one of the things you have to do as a commander in chief is you have to delegate tasks and have good people under you that, that you trust. And, and so Reagan, uh, who's going to replace Jimmy Carter in the 1980 election, is going to do far better at that than Jimmy Carter. And so let's look at uh, the highlights of his presidency. So, Gerald Ford, um, you know, pardoning Nixon, the country really never really got over that. Plus, the uh, Republicans weren't doing very well with Nixon being a Republican. And so Jimmy Carter comes in and he wins the election. OK, now um, Carter's economy uh, is not very good, um, just like uh, what Nixon and Ford uh, all and Carter are going to encounter. In fact, Reagan is going to struggle with economic issues himself when he comes into office in the 1980s. And so um, one of the things that um, um, Jimmy Carter is going to do is he's going to cut federal spending, mostly on social programs. And this angered a lot of liberal Democrats. He had trouble getting along with Congress and members of his own party. One a great example is typically the president, whatever political party they were in, would have uh, top leaders of that party, you know, have routine breakfasts over and stuff at the White House uh, to meet and kind of go over policy and what they're going to propose and yada, yada. Well, Jimmy was uh, practiced kind of what he preached of, of trying to be frugal and spending. Uh, he didn't want the White House budget to spend a bunch of money on food and, and whatnot. He would carry his own bags uh, when he would travel, which, you know, is, is admirable. Uh, but one of, the, one of the things that's interesting is Tip O'Neill, the very famous Speaker of the House, this very prominent Democrat, uh, came over to the White House for a meeting and Instead of giving a full being served a full breakfast, he got those little packaged sweet rolls. Uh, well, he was livid about it, and he told he told uh, somebody to tell the president, um, "I'm I'm not coming back to the White House until I get my full breakfast." And he and he didn't. And so um, that just kind of showed you that, that Jimmy Carter, good man, good intentions, but uh, not able to uh, really understand how Washington works. You have to play the political game, okay? And so you have to kind of woo some politicians and so forth to kind of get them to pass your policies. And Jimmy Carter's not going to be very successful at that. Um, 
you are going to have bond prices fall and interest rates rising. And so I remember my parents were talking about in the eighties when one of their car loans was at 18%. That's horrendous. Um, you typically want it um, 6% or less. Uh, one of the things that Jimmy Carter is also going to do that you'll see four presidents in a row that do. So two Democrats, two Republicans is they're going to deregulate certain industries. Okay. Uh, it was commonly thought that uh, uh, government regulation was, was hindering economic growth. And so Jimmy Carter is going to anger some of his liberal Democrats in his party by deregulating certain industries. Um, his energy plan was, is this, he just asked Americans to conserve fuel in their homes, their cars, and their businesses. So like, for instance, he would give um, sometimes nightly dresses and a sweater implying that he had turned down the heat so that way it would be colder in the White House to show that even the White House was conserving energy. Um, but Americans didn't really want that. They wanted their president to fix their energy crisis. And so um, anyway, it, it uh, uh, the National Energy Act passed under uh, the Carter administration, uh, incorporated many of, of Carter's directives. And then um, also after the Three Mile Island incident, um, people kind of began to, to begin, you know, abandoning some of their hope in nuclear energy and so forth. Look at um, the in, the gasoline prices. And so, man, it, they were skyrocketing for Carter during his administration. It was a major energy crisis. Here's all the countries that are part of OPEC. OK, um, so it's not just Middle East, but you have uh, three or uh, three or four different um, African countries, a couple of, of uh, South American countries and Indonesia as well. Now, um, one of the things that Nick's, or, or Carter got uh, criticized for um, was that he granted amnesty to those that had dodged the draft in Vietnam. Now, um, this angered a lot of Vietnam vets. Let me explain why. Because the Vietnam War was, was controversial, there were some who, who, who volunteered and, and um, or were drafted willingly and wanted to serve and so forth. But there were many Americans who got drafted who didn't want to go, and they had the courage to go, and they had others who who fled and dodged the draft and went to Canada and so forth. And they were angered that, yeah, they gave up some of their best years of their life in service of our country. And these guys aren't going to have any penalty for uh, dodging the draft. And it angered a lot of the Vietnam veteran community. Um, one of the things though that Jimmy Carter did do is he appointed um, more African-Americans into government positions, uh, but he, he cut social program funding, which angered some in that faction as well. Now, um, let's look at Carter's foreign policy, okay? So let's talk about one success um, and then one failure. All right, the successful thing is what's called the Camp David Accords. Um, Jimmy Carter had, he was really passionate about the Middle East and um, you know Israel had fought several wars against Egypt and Syria and Jordan and, and over the past uh, decades. They fought at least three wars and he wanted to bring peace to the region. Now he knew that Egypt um, was one of the most powerful countries in that region. And so if they could come to a peace agreement with Israel, then that would set off a precedence with Syria and Jordan and other countries. And so he um, asked uh, Anwar el-Sadat and Benakim Begin, um, Anwar el-Sadat was the leader of Egypt and Benakim Begin was the leader of Israel, to travel to Camp David. Uh, Camp David is a presidential retreat center founded by Eisenhower uh, in Maryland. It's a real pretty uh, uh, grounds. And so it's kind of a way for the president to get away and kind of decompress, but also come up with policies and invite foreign leaders and stuff there. Anyway, it's nice. Um, and so he advised them there. They, they meet there for a while. Um, J Carter really stayed persistent, and you got to give him credit for uh, making sure that they end up working on an agreement. And this agreement since 1978 has stayed in place to present day. And so uh, Egypt and Israel uh, have been at peace, have not gone to war since. Uh, it's been huge for the, the region. Uh, it was hard to get that passed, and that's a big accomplishment for Jimmy Carter's foreign policy. Uh, Anwar el-Sadat ends up getting, uh, uh, him and uh, Benaki and Begin get criticized big time in their home countries for doing this. I think I think Begin gets assassinated. Maybe Anwar el-Sadat gets assassinated as well. But um, they they end up having uh, major criticism for signing with what with, with some of their home people uh, think is, is uh, their, their arch enemy. Um, so let's look at uh, a failure for Carter and his foreign policy. Um, he had been trying to work out another SALT treaty like the one that, that Nixon had done. And uh, it was called, it's going to be SALT II. 
And they began working on this, but then the Soviet Union ruthlessly invades Afghanistan in 1979. They invade in December of 1970, last month. So it's really a war of the 80s. And Afghanistan becomes um, the Soviet Union's Vietnam, so to speak. Uh, it becomes a quagmire. Um, they wanted um, Afghanistan as a communist nation. Um, the Afghan people resisted the Communist Party there, and so the Soviet Union invades in response. And so uh, it's kind of just like the United States intervenes in, in South Vietnam to stop the spread of communism. Soviet Union intervenes in Afghanistan to stop the spread of democracy. And so they end up fighting an eight-year war. Um, really what helps the Afghan fighter, they're called, the, their fighter group is called the Mujahideen, um, is that the CIA, through via Pakistan, sends in Stinger missiles to them that are very effective at shooting down the Soviet massive helicopters that they have. So similar to the Soviet Union providing weapons to for the North Vietnamese Army to fight against the United States in the 60s and early 70s with Vietnam, the United States returns a favor via the CIA uh, um, in the Afghan war. Now, so, uh, a radical faction of that Mujahideen is going to break off and create the Taliban, and uh, some of the, and the Taliban is later going to support al-Qaeda, which is going to be responsible for 9-11. So this is a famous picture of Anwar al-Sadat, Menachem Begin shaking hands. And uh, Jimmy Carter, they're, they're all cheesing up there because their handshake was very awkward. And then, and then President Carter grabbed their hands and shook him. And that's why they're all grinning. They're like, oh, this is awkward. Um, and so, but it was a big time uh, thing that's still in place today. So when the Soviets invade Afghanistan, Moscow hosted the Olympics. The United States uh, ended up boycotting um, the, the 1980 Olympics. There was, some, there was about 60 nations that eventually uh, participated in the boycott for the Olympics. When in 1984, the Olympics were held in L.A., the Soviet Union, not to be one-upped, did the same thing to the United States. And that's the Olympics that Carl Lewis won quite a few uh, gold medals. So here's Afghanistan. The Soviet Union finds out that it's one of the hardest places in the world to invade. Um, Genghis Khan didn't even go there, if that tells you anything in world history, because uh, the Mongols could conquer just about anything. Uh, Tamerlane uh, did conquer it, though. So this is uh, um, the Soviets are fighting against guerrilla war tactics and so forth. Now, what ends up happening next is the Iran hostage crisis. This is going to really be a complete failure for Jimmy Carter and his presidency. If you want to see a great movie about this event, Argo, it's based on a true story. And Argo was a, 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 this thing planned by uh, the CIA. It was a brilliant strategy to get some of these people out of there. But what ends up happening is um, the, the Iranian government was led by a pro-American guy by the name of the Shah. Uh, his name is Mohammad Pavli. And um, the United States, with the CIA's help, kind of helped uh, in, in get him into power in 1954. Well, a more radical Islamic sector um, led by the Ayatollah Khomeini, this religious leader, overthrew the Shah. He flees to France. He was actually getting treatment for cancer. And what ends up happening is the, the Iranian government becomes very radical. They, they uh, kick out or suppress any people they view were secular. And so that's why um, today Houston has a large Iranian population because a lot of the pro-Shah Iranians flee to the United States for asylum. In fact, my father-in-law, when he was at, at Texas Tech, he remembers in intramural football, there was an Iranian flag football team that were pro-Shah, and then it was an Iranian flag football team with their national students that were pro-Ayatollah Khomeini. He remembers them breaking out in a fist fight in, in the mural fields. So things were got things got intense, to say the least. But the, um, when the United States refuses to turn over the Shah um, to the Ayatollah Khomeini's government, because they were going to hang him, the guy's dying of cancer, um, they get mad and they storm the U.S. Embassy, and they held 52 Americans hostage for 444 days. Now, the reason why the, the Argo plan happens is there were some who weren't in the embassy when it happened, and they fled to the Canadian um, ambassador's home and hid in his basement. And uh, what the Argo mission is, is Ben Affleck plays the, the, the character from the CIA who actually goes in, they pretend they're Canadian filmmakers making a Star Wars type movie in the desert, Afghanistan, and they get them out of there um, kind of her heroically and save their lives. Um, but Americans, every night they would hear on the news, it's now day 43 of the Iran hostage crisis. It's now day 57. Well, there are 444 days of this. And Americans felt like Jimmy Carter was weak and that he should go in 
and uh, take care of Iran and get back American hostages. How dare they do this? They were burning American flags in the streets. That's, that's, that was their mindset. And so Jimmy Carter did call in a special forces operation to go in and rescue them. But the problem is a helicopter malfunction and crashed and it failed. He didn't want to bomb them some, um, and so forth and have a, a provoked war with uh, uh, globally and so forth. And so he spent uh, it literally the, the last night of his presidency, even though he's lost the election, against Ronald Reagan. Literally, while Reagan is getting inaugurated, they have released the hostages. And he was able, he stayed up all night, the night before, and got them uh, to finally agree to release them. And so he did use peaceful methods, and he was successful. Reagan gets credit for them getting released. It had nothing to do with Reagan. Actually, had everything to do with Jimmy Carter uh, and so forth. But that was the Iran hostage crisis that, that stained um, Carter's presidency big time. Here is the Ayatollah Khomeini in the top right. These are American um uh, citizens who are captured and being led blindfold, they would oftentimes pretend they were going to shoot them and torment them and all that kind of stuff. Uh, but really, uh, Jimmy Carter is known for human rights. The, the Camp David Accords is a really a human rights initiative. Um, he does um, sign an agreement with Panama in the late 70s that in the year 2000, the Panama Canal is going to be completely turned over to Panama instead of being run by the United States, which Panama got, got money from the Panama Canal each and every year, and the United States built it. Um, but some Americans were upset about that. Um, he also um, reversed a policy um, in the Cold War that oftentimes they would support bad uh, dictators so long as they weren't communists. Carter was going to reverse that and no longer support bad dictators just because they weren't communists. Um, he did try to reduce nukes, but that does not happen because of uh, the invasion of Afghanistan. Um, and so... One of the things that you'll see as well is um, the 1980 election. Jimmy Carter is going to lose the election um, against Ronald Reagan. And it's, it's because some of his foreign policy failures that lead to that happening. And we'll get to the 1980s in another lecture.